uh, this session will be the closing session of the day program for today. It's called The Science, Politics and Culture of Climate Change Beyond a Climate of Fear. And we will have a, a presentation by Kevin Anderson and then that will be followed by a dialogue with some more guests. But first off, uh, we will have a short intervention by Karin Sundby, who is the chairperson of Klimatriksdagen 2018. Uh, that is the Swedish climate parliament that took place last week. And she will make a quick reporting back from that, which will be very interesting to hear. So welcome up, Karin. Thank you, Sana. And thank you so much for having me. We're very glad to receive the invitation. You said last week, it was actually, we finished it yesterday, so. <laughs> it's been quite an intensive weekend. So the People's Climate Parliament, what is that? Hundreds of Swedish uh, people gathered in Stockholm this weekend for uh, People's Climate Parliament. We've received over 250 climate proposals that we have been working with. And this weekend, we voted 12 of those that we handed over to all government parties. 12 proposals, where uh, one proposal was actually written by Isaac Stoddard and Kevin Anderson and a few others. They were received yesterday by representatives of the Swedish um, government of the different parties and it actually it felt very good it felt like they were very well received and that they will not be put in a, in a drawer somewhere but actually uh, be taken into to their political plans um, in the future that's at least what we hope so the weekend has been um, a whole lot of different seminars we've had panel discussions We've had um, a forum and uh, an exhibition where companies have uh, shown sustainable solutions uh, for the future. Uh, we've looked at different local initiatives. Uh, it's basically been like a big melting pot with inspiration uh, and people have been able to gather strength to move forward and to, to work, continue working with this issue. Our goal with the climate parliament is to raise the climate issue in light of the Swedish elections and of course after that as well. We want all political parties, no matter if they're left or right, to take this issue and show, uh, show us voters what it is that they want to do, but concrete actions and show us where that will lead us. It's been interesting because this weekend the, the um, question of a new narrative for, uh, for the climate issue, the climate challenge, has come up several times. We need a new narrative. And it actually felt like this weekend was some kind of beginning of that new narrative because we've seen people from so many different places we, we were uh, invited to TV4, uh, to uh, the national uh, television show last week. And we were called, they said, um, this weekend a group of climate activists will meet in Stockholm. But it's no longer a little group of uh, climate activists. The new narrative is a broad group of people with all different backgrounds that are really struggling 150% to move this forward and to actually make a change. And this new connections and these people is a part of that new narrative. That's at least the way it felt this weekend. So if you have questions after this session, I will be here for a while. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Karin. Uh, I forgot to tell you when we started. On your seats, you have all found this or something similar. Uh, this is a contribution to 
a participatory installation that will be made uh, by all of us who would like to contrib contribute. So you are invited to share your seed of sustainability. Uh, and it says on here that you should share uh, existing concrete initiatives that embody what you see as seeds of sustainability. So please do this uh, sometime tonight and put it up on the, you can find it on a wall when you go towards dinner later. Uh, and it will be um, used in a, one of the parallel workshops tomorrow morning. So please do your contribution for that before tomorrow morning. And the technology is back on. So I would like to welcome Kevin Anderson up on stage. Kevin is Sandstrom Professor in Climate Change Leadership at CMS, Uppsala University. He's also Professor of Energy and Climate Change at University of Manchester, Deputy Director at Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research, and in Sweden, also known as the climate scientist who refuses to fly. So welcome, Kevin. Is that working? Can you all hear me okay? I just, just suddenly thought, if anyone from the outside is watching this, you've got a, a Twitter handle of Climex, and you've got pieces of paper here saying, share your seed of sustainability. <laughs> so, I thought, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, <laughs> so uh, I've been asked to re um, just make some reflections on the period from 2008 to 2018, the time of the Climate Existence Conference. And probably I've been asked to do this because not many of you here were, were old enough to remember 2008, so it's only old people that have asked this question. Um, so um, I'm also asked to comment on, the, on it, or think about it as um, beyond, the climate, beyond the climate of, um, you probably all recognize the quite famous picture, the scream, monk's scream. And then I think you should choose one from the following, hopelessness. You know, what can I do? Indifference, I'm not really bothered. Selfishness, I reckon I'll be okay. Sycophancy, negative emissions will save the political business as usual. Arrogance, what most academics have. My importance compensates for my higher emissions. Astrology, or economics, uh, green taxes and gr uh, carbon taxes and green growth are the way forward, or fear, which I spend some time thinking about what is fear? And... In the end, I think it is, to me, it was th this captured my interpretation, an empathised realisation of the chaos that we're unleashing. And the, the important word there is empathised. I don't think you can, I don't think it's an objective assessment. I don't think it's from understanding or from knowledge or information. It's much more, from some of the things Vanessa was talking about, it's much more uh, sort of the way you embody it. It's a, a sense of it. And empathy is a very different thing from understanding. And I think the fear comes from, from empathising. You know, the chaos that we are unleashing. I also want, as a sub-question behind this, which I'm not going to answer, but for us to think, um, you know, are we all denialists now? And I think probably the answer for most of us is yes, of course. Um, I've been asked to, because I always talk about numbers. I, was hoping, I thought, well, a climate existence conference, maybe I'll do something different. It'd be quite nice, but anyway. I've been asked to bring some numbers to the climate existence event. Um, which for this conference, so far, what I've seen so far from what I look, look at the program is about, is, is, you know, it's not a comfortable space. Um, I think if you ask Vanessa to go to a, a climate or economic modeling conference, she would feel like I do now. Um, but I think discomfort is really important. I think we should be leaving uncomfortable, squirming in our seats, being asked difficult questions about ourselves, our values, our empathy. So I think discomfort is an essential thing to have if we're going to start to think differently about the challenges we face. But anyway, numbers. Um, so I'm going to start off here with The, with the Guardian um, and uh, a quote, uh, um, a report that some of you will have seen that the world's carbon dioxide levels are the highest for 650,000 years, says US report. Rise in, green, in chief greenhouse gas um, worse than feared. Earth may be losing ability to absorb carbon dioxide, say scientists. Concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has reached a record high, according to the latest figures. Oh, sorry. I don't know why, but this happens with HDMI for some reason, not with VGA. But, so this could happen quite a bit. So uh, this is a bit of a nuisance. But anyway, does that come back up yet? Oh, it has. Oh. Yeah, I feel I talk quicker, maybe it won't go off. Um, 
So you know, the climate change could be beginning, beginning to slide out of control. Scientists at Mauna Loa observe that the CO2 levels are now at 387 parts per million, up 40% since the Industrial Revolution. But the more astute of you will notice that's 2008, the year of the first climate existence event. And we were saying this 10 years ago. So presumably we've done a lot since, because there was a real sense of fear, a real sense that we've got a massive challenge in 2008, the year before Copenhagen. Um, so this was our emissions up to 2008, and no doubt after 2008, of course, they've come down. But of course they haven't. They've just done what everyone else would expect. In a bit more detail, we'll show you that here we have um, the economic, the banking crisis, and then they'll see what, what's happened since. So basically emissions have continued going up. In fact, we're 14% higher emissions in 2017 than we were in 2008. So that's a reflection of the depth of our concern for climate change, a 14% increase. This is taken from the Washington Post in 2018, um, and it points out uh, there that for the first time humans have been monitoring, atmospheric CO2 levels have exceeded 410 parts per million. Remember, it was 387 before. 410 parts per million averaged across an entire month, and pushing us towards a threshold that some people say is um, above safe. And the safe is interesting there, because what we mean by that is safe for rich white people in the Northern Hemisphere. We don't mean safe for poor, poor black people elsewhere. We've never really cared about those in climate change or indeed any other area. Um, and our CO2 concentrations uh, are up 6% since um, 2008. So CO2 emissions up 14%, concentration in the atmosphere, which will not come down for a long time now throughout our lives, 6% um, increase. What else do we know about the numbers and the science? Well, the IPCC report, the latest set of reports, came out in 2013 and 2014, and at last it made clear that cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide determine the, the, uh, the surface temperature um, across this century. And basically, this is the framing of carbon budgets. It's carbon budgets, not long-term targets, that matter when it comes to temperature. And um, you know, it's a personal thing. That for me, this is quite a big change because this is a paper from two th or a report from 2006 that I wrote with colleagues arguing that we should be looking at carbon budgets. In 2008, when this conference first started, we published our first report given the international carbon budgets for two degrees centigrade. And in fact, we did one that year also for the UK. So you know, it's been a long time, this whole carbon budget framework. And, and only now is it being embedded into a policy thinking. The problem is, when you take a carbon budget framework, not a long-term target framework, the whole Paris commitments look far, far more challenging. And we have told with some numbers, so a few more numbers. Um, for tw from 2018, and a reasonable chance of 2 degrees centigrade, which, as I said before, is not safe for many people around the world, we can emit about 750 billion tons from now out to forever of carbon dioxide. 750 billion. We emit about 42 a year. So, save you doing the calculation, 18 years of current emissions at a global level, and there'll be nothing left for a two degrees centigrade, a dangerous threshold for many. So what has our response been to this challenge? Has it been any better than it was in 2008, or what's happened since 2008? Well, I think we've had a, a litany of technocratic, and I don't know many Swedish words, but this one I really like, uh, svindlery. What is, it, is, that, is, that, is that better pronunciation than the other day? Yeah. Um, a cons, fraud, you know, any other word, just substitute another word for it. What we had, we've already heard about this one today, offsetting, paying the poor to diet for us. In fact, I thought about this. It's actually, perhaps it would better be described if it should say, paying the poor to die for us would be a more accurate interpretation. That's what offsetting is. The clean development mechanism, which is state-sanctioned offsetting. Offsetting, I see, in, from a climate perspective, is worse than doing nothing. Emissions trading. Which is so many, with so many permits issued, the price of carbon remained basically zero. We've now got the whole concept of afforestation embodied, embedded in the new models. You plant a tree, you expand an airport. So the Swedish government looking to expand both Islander and to build an airport up north so you can fly to the skiing whilst it still exists. And where this litany of scams fails, which it inevitably will, we're relying on speculative negative emission technologies. These don't exist, but they are embedded in every single model advising governments and the IPCC on 2 degrees centigrade. These are technologies in the future that will suck the CO2 out of the air. And if anyone knows about issues of entropy will realize that's not very practical. Um, and when that one fails, which virtually everyone who works in it thinks it will not deliver as in the models, we're going to have geoengineering 
we're going to fire rockets into the stratosphere and blast out sulfates into the stratosphere to reflect sunlight into space. And you think I'm joking. We have academic projects working that out now and economists working out what the cost will be of the rockets. 28 years since the first IPCC report and we've had no mitigation. No reductions in emissions for 28 years, but we've tried this litany of spindleries. Can you say it's plural? Is that spindleries? Yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> so just looking at Sweden, or indeed the UK, and one these, now these are countries that um, are well known for their climate change action. Um, they, well, Sweden has very low carbon electricity, and the UK is actually getting lower carbon electricity, and they've got a strong, well, Sweden has a reputation as a progressive nation. I don't think the UK could could claim that one. Um, and yet Sweden, this progressive nation with a new climate change law as well, has seen virtually no reduction in its emissions since 1990. So since some of you were born, no reduction in Sweden's emissions. Now they'll tell you they've seen reductions because they've conveniently ignored aviation and shipping. Has that gone off again? And um, they've conveniently ignored aviation and shipping and they've also um, not taken account of imports and exports like laptops and um, HDMI leads. So let's try again. Does it come through? Come on, come on. Right, so, right. So Sweden has seen no reduction. In fact, look at the new climate change law. I mean, this is, this is, this is as new as they get. This is just off the press, the climate change law. So that's the emissions um, we've seen historically from Sweden. We look at the climate change law, and this is Isaac and, and my best interpretation of it. Now, ex first, it excludes international aviation and shipping. So about 17, 15 to 17% of Sweden's emissions are now the responsibility of God, not Sweden. It has no carbon budget framework, so it's based on astrology, not science. It does include the other greenhouse gases. And of course, it's supported by Johan Rockström. That sort of analysis, the carbon law analysis. This is the carbon law analysis here. But both of those include negative emission technologies that do not exist, and neither of them take any notice of equity. In other words, the poor people elsewhere will have to have a very, very small part of the carbon pie because rich people in Sweden and the UK and elsewhere want a very big bit again. Instead, imagine we excluded negative emissions, because they probably won't work at scale. And let's imagine we included even a weak interpretation of equity. Then the curve looks more like that. Zero CO2 for Sweden by about 2035 to 2040 from its complete energy system. So you can see why people don't like carbon budgets. And it's the same for the UK. That's the UK curve from the government. Take away the noise off the, off the plot. And that's two degrees centigrade. So two of the most progressive countries in the world are doing almost nothing on climate, well, almost worse than nothing on climate change in some respects, because they're pretending to do something. I prefer a wolf in wolf's clothing than a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, so since the 2008 um, the Climate Existence Conference. We've committed uh, in Paris to aim for two degrees centigrade and, and ideally one and a half. We've recognized that it's carbon budgets that should um, frame our analysis, not long-term targets. Our governments have upped the mitigation rhetoric very significantly, but delivered no meaningful mitigation. Um, climate scientists have embedded negative emission technologies, so we have a, and in the future, geoengineering, so we can maintain business as usual. Um, concerned academics have flown to ever more jamborees, oops, sorry, essential conferences. Um, and annual carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide emissions surprisingly have gone up by 14% and 60%, or over 60% since 1990. And the CO2 levels are now higher than they've been for 800,000 years and probably nearer 5 million years. So it's not looking too good. So whether you're a politician, whether you're a scientist, an academic, a business leader, a journalist, or civil society, we've all chosen to head for hell in a handcart. That's where we are now in 2018. I think it's quite important to try and, try and lay out the reality of the situation you're in and then say, well, what do we do? So here we are, off to hell in our handcart. Um, if we dig in that, are there any reasons for, for light in that despair? Well, I, I was at the COP this year um, in uh, Bonn, Bonn Fiji COP, which is a terrible affair. It was, uh, the, the Paris one was challenging, but I felt there was something positive about it. The, the Bonn one was just incredibly depressing. And I was on the train back, a two-day train journey back from Bonn. Um, 
There used to be overnight tra uh, trains, but the, uh, the planes have stopped those now. Um, so two days back, so I thought, I'm going to have to write something more positive, otherwise I'm just going to pack up and start cycling and rock climbing for the rest of my life. So I was trying to dig out something positive. Um, though this was a cathartic piece, really just written for myself. Anyway, it was picked up and published in The Conversation, which is um, an academic, it's not academic publication, but it publishes academic work, um, but in a more sort of accessible language. And in fact, the, the version of that is on some of your seats, which if you want to read it, you can do, and if not, I'll, I'll collect them up later. Um, and what I tried to do in that is to try to sort of think, you know, what, are there any thoughts for real hope? And actually, when you think about it, since 2008, coincidentally, I think the world has gone through and is going through massive levels of upheaval that we sort of you know, mobile elite don't really recognize quite so much because we're pretty much insulated from some of it, or at least we're partly insulated from some of it. But I think there are some massive changes that are occurring, and no doubt I've missed, I've missed many here. I'm not saying these are good or bad. All I'm saying is that there are some really large shifts. The banking crisis. I mean, we've seen nothing like this since the Depression. And what came along with it? Well, actually, quantitative easing. Overnight, governments that said, we've got no money for renewable power, we've got no money to help the poor with this, that, and the other, suddenly found trillions of dollars, literally at the stroke of a pen, to give to the banks. So we, have, we are not short of resources. We can mobilize them almost instantaneously. And about half of the quantitative easing is real money. Half of it is just a, just a scam. And we also realize that markets don't self-regulate. Every sentient being except for economists knows that anyway. Um, but at least now the economists know it as well. And we, have, we now have the social media, which wasn't there in 2008. So it comes with all its amorphous twists and turns. But I would give me the choice of, in the UK, 60 million people on Twitter, or four rich white people living in the countryside in great big gated mansions owning the newspapers. I'll take 60 million people writing nonsense on Twitter rather than four white people telling me what I should, what I should hear and learn from. Remember, that's been happening for 100 years in the UK. The media is owned by a small handful of people. So it's a positive thing, I think, that we have um, social media. Um, come on now. Is it back again? I think this might be the last time, hopefully, so it should be coming towards the end. Right. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, right. Um, Oh, oh you, can see the, you can see the list. Sanders and Corbyn. Sanders in the States, a man that said he's a socialist and wasn't shot. A few years ago, he'd been picked up by McCarthy and put in prison in the US. Now, this thing's incredible that someone like that could stand up and actually almost, if the Democrats had had a bit more guts, could have actually stood up against Trump and actually, you know, there's some evidence that suggests that he may well have beaten Trump. Corbyn in the UK. I'm not saying these are good or bad. I have their own judgments whether they are good or bad, but I think it's interesting that these people had no support from the establishment, no support, and actually, they became quite high-profile high figures. Brexit and Trump, when you, know, you can take your own judgments whether these are good or bad things. Um, but again, it's the establishment that has been questioned by a new constituency that the left simply hasn't cared about for years, the, dust, the right never cared about, but the left hasn't cared about, you know, the Dust Belt or the poor people in the UK that have lost out through globalization. So that's interesting that these things are happening that no one expected. The Arab Spring, I'm not saying it's a good a good thing that happened in the Arab Spring, or a bad thing. But it certainly changes occurred in ways that no one really expected. Um, the plummeting price of renewables. Again, you go back to 2008, no one thought the price of solar or offshore wind would come to where it is today. So it's, and it's still coming down. What's interesting about both of those, the prices are still plummeting and are causing problems in the energy system now because it's actually cheaper than a lot of the conventional forms of energy generation. And then we've got the rising concerns over in, in Europe over petrol and diesel in our cities and our, affecting our health and in the poor parts of the world, particularly coal usage. And, and this has been supported by people like the IMF who are raising this as a genuine concern. I was in Umeå the other day, and Umeå suffers a lot from air pollution from its cars because of its inversion layer. So even in Sweden, you're suffering these issues. That's a, remember, that's a subsidy to the fossil fuel industry. So is there any hope from chaos? Um, in themselves, I would argue, each of these is going to have some sort of impact on the way our society evolves. But if you could start to align some of these massive upheavals that we're actually going through now, I think there is a chance, I'm not saying it's likely, but there's a chance that you could push them in a direction. You could write a narrative around them or narratives around them that could, could push forward a progressive and epoch-changing confluence of circumstances. In other words, you start to make these things move in a similar direction. And this sort of thing that I think you could pull out of some of Naomi, some of, uh, Naomi Klein's discussion um, would, would, I think, fit with that. Um, but I do think you know, when we look at it, when we stand back from this, what we see is that most political and economic pontificators, of which there are far too many, buttressed by naysayers and the established elites, and in that I mean universities, 
um, and the established elites, um, remain incapable of seeing beyond the 20th century, and if in the UK, beyond the 19th century, and if you're the Conservative Party in the UK, about the 18th century. Um, but the 21st century is already proving to be a different country. It is not the same place as the 20th century. Those people had their day, and we need to be thinking very differently about that now. And I think we could yet shape something that was um, a different interpretation, a positive, progressive interpretation of, um, I'll forget that then, of prosperity, sustainability, and equity. Do I think it's likely? No, I don't think it's likely. Do I think it's possible? Yes. How do I think it comes about? It comes about by people like you, by us, and other people who, who have tried to empathize with these issues, pushing very hard, being very uncomfortable, questioning ourselves, questioning our colleagues, having integrity, thinking differently. And that is difficult for us all to do. But I do think if you start to think of this, these sort of set of things that are happening around the world, there is actual scope for a radical shift occurring quite soon towards something that would be broadly in line with the sorts of things that Vanessa was outlining earlier, or from the, what the numbers tell us what we need to do on climate change for Paris. And on that upbeat hope, thank you very much for listening. You can't see it. It says that thank you for listening. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Kevin. Uh, and while we get our speakers set with microphones, uh, I would like to invite all of you to uh, just share a two-minute reflection with the person sitting next to you on what, you, what Kevin just presented for us. And if I may ask people by the window, could you help with opening up maybe some windows so we get some air in? Uh, first, I would like to welcome, so now we will have a dialogue with four guests in the panel. Uh, Kevin, you're welcome. We all know Kevin now, I think. <laughs> and uh, I would also like to welcome up uh, Vanessa Andriotti, who we know from this morning, professor at University of British Columbia. Uh, Jens Holm, Swedish politician, member of the Swedish parliament for the Swedish left party, and also an author of uh, a book on climate politics for the left party. And Anja Fjellgren, uh, president of the Youth Council for the Sami Parliament. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. So, as we heard uh, today or this year, it's 10 years since the first Climate Existence Conference. And I would the first conference actually in 2008 was in Swedish, but in 2010, the second Climate Existence Conference was held in English. And when I looked through the webpage, uh, I found the invita invitation to that conference, and I would like to start this panel with reading something from that. So this was said eight years ago. Today, most of us know that climate change poses a real and serious threat to our societies but the changes proposed are often focused on the implementation of economic and technological solutions, and a lot of emphasis is being put on the physical and infrastructural aspects of this new challenge humanity faces. Very little is said about the need to challenge our minds, mindsets, and lifestyles to respond to climate change, or the moral, ethical, and psychological aspects of the changes needed. And at least from my perspective, this still feels very re relevant and it's also quite similar to the way this conference is phrased today. So in this conversation, I hope that we will explore a bit if, this, uh, uh, if climate change and the way we work with and talk about climate change has that at all changed in the last 10 years or where are we today and what has happened. And I would like to start uh, with asking you, Jens, uh, in your work uh, with climate-related politics, how do you see that climate change is being discussed uh, within, within the political sphere today, and has that changed at all in the last 10 years? Yeah, good afternoon. Great to, to be here. Um, yeah, of course, there has been some changes in, in the way we discuss uh, the issue and so on. Um, I relate very much to 2009 and the climate change uh, conference in, in Copenhagen. And actually, I would say that the, 
the issue was much more on the agenda uh, during that time uh, than it is now. And, and that's a bit, uh, well, disappointing to, to say the least and surprising since, uh, well, as Kevin explained, uh, the situation has just gotten worse and we have uh, even more information about how, how dire the situation is. So, uh, but I think also we can learn something from uh, 2009. What happened then? Uh, how was it possible that uh, even a politician like Fredrik Reinfeldt said that, yeah, climate change is the most important issue and we need to have it on top of the agenda, etc. Um, well, we, we managed to build up a momentum. Uh, there were a lot of mass movements uh, for the climate in Sweden and, and elsewhere. And I hope that we can build up that momentum again. And what would it uh, take for that to, to build up again? Uh, Naomi Klein uh, says in one of her books that uh, we need to play climate change on repeat, on repeat again and again and again. And I think that's uh, true. We just need to go on uh, campaigning, talking, etc. Uh, I was very happy uh, yesterday at the Climate, uh, climate uh, Riksdag, uh, Karin, uh, hold an introduction here and uh, it's actually kind of a new movement uh, I saw a lot of new faces I saw old people very young people I saw academics I saw grassroots activists and uh, a new climate movement is perhaps born uh, so that's very promising uh, in a way so I think you should just uh, go on and uh, build up build on that and other mass movements and you should put pressure on us politicians and I can tell you that if we get more than uh, more than three email uh, in one day, uh, which is not a spam email, well, we need to take it seriously. I start to ask my colleagues, or my colleagues start to ask me, oh, Jens, now we got uh, three different emails asking about uh, uh, climate change and meat consumption, or climate change and flying. What, what's our position on that? And that is exactly uh, how you should work, or one idea, how you can put pressure on us and uh, demand well thought through uh, answers from us. Thank you. I think we'll for sure come back to, to the political aspect of this. Uh, but I would like to bring in Anja. Um, your work within the Sami parliament, um, how is climate change being discussed and experienced uh, in your context today? Um, hi, everyone. Um, this Sami people and reindeer husbandry is already affected by climate change in uh, many senses. Uh, primarily that the reindeer husbandry have to supplement or feed their herd during winter period. And that's the, in that context we often discuss how climate change is affecting us and how we should deal with it in the future. But uh, the Sami parliament is under the Swedish parliament, so we don't have such much things to talk about and say. But it is discussed and we are experiencing it. And have you experienced a change during the past 10 years or the years that you've been engaged with it? Yes, um, you, we all maybe have seen how the winter have changed during the 10 years. from very cold winters to these three last years, very mild winters with rain in November and December. And it's, it's especially that who's affecting us. So the climate is changing. And I will, it will be some shifts here just because to get, bring you all into the discussion. Uh, Vanessa, we heard your talk already here in the morning. Um, would you like to share some thoughts or reflections on Kevin's talk, but also the comments in the panel so far? And you have also have experience from working uh, with the indigenous <coughs> societies, right? Yes, so I think um, exactly the talk today talking about um, when you don't want to do the indigenous uh, policy. Madonna anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
So I started the talk this morning um, with a quote from Dwayne Donald, who is an indigenous scholar in Alberta. And he says that the problems we're facing is not, uh, are not a problem, that they're not related to information. They're a problem related to habits of existence. So I think indigenous people that I've worked with in Latin America and in North America, but also hearing from the Sami, are insisting on a change of existence not just a change of policy, not just a change even in consumption. We have to be relating to the world in a very different way. I also started to talk by acknowledging the earth as a living entity, including the sea, right, as, as, um, as a relationship that we have. And this is also coming from uh, protocols that uh, indigenous people are requesting academics to, to adopt in university. And we know that we can't impose this on people, uh, it's always an invitation to exist differently. But as soon as we start to interrupt our satisfaction with the pleasures and the enjoyments and the securities that um, this modern colonial world has afforded us, maybe we will have a chance to discover other ways of being with each other beyond boundaries and beyond um, existence defined by knowledge and consumption. So looking at the voices of indigenous people at this point, I think for less, uh, in 2008, we wouldn't have heard um, this amplified to this extent. Still, uh, we have the technocratic, techno-happy, and the policy people dominating the discussions, but I see more and more people coming up with <coughs> questions about what do we do as beings, not just uh, at the level of doing or thinking, but how do we exist differently? It's a question of being differently with the planet and with each other. So I think there is a change. I don't think uh, with you too, Kevin, that I think there, there are possibilities. I think they're, uh, they're not probable <laughs> or likely. <laughs> they are openings and cracks, but they are worth uh, exploring and investing in. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Uh, and yes, Kevin, uh, relating to this, uh, you said earlier today as well, um, just over lunch, that you think that climate change is a fundamental different issue today than it was 10 years ago in 2008. Would you like to, to okay. share or comment on, do you still think that or? Yeah, no, I, th I think that. Have you changed your mind? <laughs> hmm? Say again? Do you still think that? Yeah, since lunch. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, it's good to change your mind, but perhaps not within three hours. Um, no, I think it is different. I think the problem is climate change is a cumulative challenge. It's a, the, 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 way the, the way the problem builds up in the atmosphere, you, ca you can't just keep living with it and say, we'll solve it tomorrow, which is the way that policy makers have dealt with it. And indeed, it's the way that scientists, the scientific community has talked about it, about what happens by 2050 or 2100, which is a shorthand that scientists have misused, really, and it's been very unhelpful. But because it's a cumulative problem, every day you fail, you change the climate. You lock in a changed climate. And so 2008 was a long time ago. Emissions are much higher now. And all the emissions, no, well, 50% of all the carbon dioxide since 2008, so in 10 years, 400, that's 200 or so billion tons of carbon dioxide that we have put in the atmosphere. We've put 400 billion tons since 2008. About half of that will be there changing the climate for hundreds, if not thousands, possibly 10,000 years. So we have guaranteed to change the climate as a consequence of our ongoing choice to fail since 2008. So yet what we face today is a very different beast to what we faced then. Um, and also, of course, is that it's given an opportunity for different parties to get, get their positions more entrenched. So the fossil fuel companies have thought more about how they will defend. So you've got the BPs and the Shells coming out and saying, actually, we really care about climate change. You know, they don't care any more than ESSO does, but um, you know, they claim that. So they're already finding forms of defense, which is why we have negative emission technologies. So remember, we didn't have those in 2008, not, not, as, not as much in the models. Now we've got them in there, and every single model with negative emission technologies, which is all of them, includes fossil fuels running out until 2100 and beyond. So what we've done is we've described something now, a technical economic framing, that is business as usual. And so that's much more entrenched than it was pre-Copenhagen when there was a discussion about 
could, could there be a new way of thinking about you know, tackling these challenges? And remember then, like, climate change is just a symptom of a wider post-enlightenment sort of failure of relationship between us and nature. It's just, it's just one symptom. It's not, it's in itself, it's just, it's, you know, it's not the problem. What do you say, Jens? Do you uh, agree on that we today are even more locked in to technological solutions and maybe then technological <coughs> solutions that are not even within reach within the time frame that we are uh, acting within? Yeah, that's, that's probably true. And uh, yeah, where, sh where should I start? I, I, I think at least one, <coughs> one promising sign uh, is the climate law and the climate uh, framework we got in place here in Sweden. Uh, Kevin uh, uh, criticized that a lot, and so did we in, in the left party. We said it was not ambitious enough. Uh, it didn't take a, into account shipping and aviation, and uh, it relies to 15% uh, on uh, technology uh, new kind of technology, CCS, etc. But the rest of the 85% should actually be done, uh, of the re reductions should be done uh, domestically here in Sweden. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that's, uh, that that is enough, but uh, at least that is something to build on. And it also says in, in the framework that uh, if, if this is not enough, uh, new, uh, new decisions or new measures uh, might need to be taken. So. Of course, we, I, I think it's fair to, to criticize what, what we got in place in Sweden, but at least we are not in, in like North America where 50% of the political parties uh, question if uh, humans at all affects uh, the climate. Uh, at, at least we are home on that, that side of the debate, but an awful lot remains to be done, that's for sure. And uh, I don't believe in a techno fix at all. Uh, we need to change the way we live and if we are to change the way we live, we need political decisions. It's, I mean, you cannot build new railways. Uh, it, it's very good that Kevin uh, doesn't fly anymore, it's very good that I don't eat any meat any, anymore, but uh, if we could help people to take those decisions, it would be so much easier for every one of us to, to, to do the right thing. And that's why you need politics. Yes, I think uh, that we are, it's easy to get into this um, discussion in a way that we, we get stuck still within the, the practical or technical or economical um, sphere of discussing it. Uh, and I would like to ask you again, Vanessa, you talked about this, that it, it, tackling climate change entails something different, a different way of existing. How? How can we make that more concrete? How can we put that into this conversation? It's, it's interesting because in our way of being, that we're not, I guess, are you guys? Yeah? yeah, closer, like this, okay. So <laughs> in our way of being within modern societies, what, whatever is unintelligible to us seems not to exist. So the first uh, problem that we face is to be able to touch this adjacent possible. S possibilities that are viable but unimaginable or unintelligible. So the educational challenge is to move away from, we just need a solution, the concrete things quickly, let's just do it. And invite people into the unknown and into other ways of relating to each other. But as you were talking, I think one of the things that came to my mind as an example, um, at COP23, I was also in Bonn, 23, right? Yeah. And I'm confused yeah. with mm. the numbers. Yeah. So in Bonn, um, I was in a session uh, adjacent to the session in the, on, with the people in Brazil, from Brazil, talking about the Amazon. So there was a session on the Amazon in the museum. I was at the art gallery in another <coughs> session. And I went to have lunch with the people from the Amazon, because I also work with communities there. And I met an indigenous person from uh, the Krenak community, who are the relatives of the river that was killed by Valle do Rio Doce, the Rio Doce River, right? So he was saying, like this, he, he was saying, I was brought here as a forest protector, was put in this place, um, and it, it's just for show. 
Basically, he said, this is a theater. It's all hypocritical because you can talk about anything about, but continuous economic growth. That is the bottom line. And then he started crying, actually, and saying, we can't. We can't have a conversation about how our relatives are dying. My river has died. People in my community have, have died protecting the river. And here, they want me to say that I am this indigenous um, protector, but they're not ready to listen. And I'm like, yeah, as remembering it, is, it's, it's coming back. And I wanted to bring him to my conference and say, take my place and speak uh, about this to people, but speak as you're speaking to me now and say it's hypocritical, right? Um, he came to the conference, but he refused to be on stage. So um, it requires a, a complete overhaul of these emotions that, in, in, in the sense that we are numbed to each other and to the planet. And I don't know exactly what kind of educational experience can prompt us to get to the point where indifference is not an option, it's not an intellectual choice, but I believe that uh, this, as the water uh, rises and reaches our, our bum, we will have more opportunities, I think, to be with each other in a different way and to see the suffering of these communities uh, from a different space. Not intellectually, not trying to intellectualize this suffering, but to see and to feel it uh, from our guts, from our, in a visceral way. And maybe then we will unnumb our visceral connections with each other and something else will be possible. But until that happens, I think it's very difficult to just keep talking about it, right? And uh, not experiencing something different. And it seems that every possibility that lies outside what's in intelligible to us doesn't, doesn't make sense. And everything that is worthwhile it needs to make sense. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the experience of um, that Krenat friend uh, and, and brother in, the, in that community, it was not intelligible not even to the people in Brazil who were discussing the Amazon, right? So how do we break through and stop the theater mm. of the Climate Change Summit so that we can actually <coughs> get to the reality of em embodied uh, lives, not only of ours, uh, our bodies, but the body of the planet uh, is, is a huge challenge. Do you want to comment? I, I can. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I I just wonder, Vanessa, because I've been to uh, quite some cups uh, too, and uh, I agree. It's it's like the minister's uh, show, and uh, yeah, it's like a theater, as you say. But on the other hand, uh, should we not have the cups? Um, that's <laughs> that's what I wonder. But because at least the cups would be would be like the, the biggest multi, multinational meetings that we have at, at the moment. And it's something to, to gear up to, I think. And we can have uh, activism around it and, and so on. Uh, what I think we should do is to, to make the COPs more, more democratic, more transparent, and, and so on. Um, yeah, or what do you think? Uh, are, are they not any useful at all? Or? I think there are cracks in the cops. Mm. <laughs> uh, and I think we need to create these interruptions and trouble it, mm. as you say. But maybe in order to do that, we will have to have people opposing the cops and saying, maybe we should just stop this because it will push other people to do it differently. So I'm not, uh, what I'm saying is that those who are opposing it now, and I think some, some people are just saying, this is just a theater, don't engage, can be actually aiding those who want to change it. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah, I see. There's a, yeah. there's a, a connection there. Mm. So I would support both, actually, <laughs> those who are changing, okay. those who are opposing, so that uh, you have support, as you were saying, from the inside with your emails coming, mm. right? To say, we need to change this. But we need to change it, it in a deeper level. Not just, it's not just doing, it's not just thinking, it's being. How do we get people in the cops to experience, um, to experience the things Viscerally. Mm, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> Arts in, in, in one, embodied, like going out and like maybe taking people to the place, take, take them to the tar sands mm. in Canada. Mm. And, they just and, have and to go that. to northern Sweden yeah. and yeah. study the summer people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shall we do the cops instead of doing it in Bond? Let's do it where the, the, in Alberta. 
mm. and then we see what's happening to the earth. There are lots of um, videos now uh, in Canada circulating of people flying over the tar sands region, and it's impossible not to feel what's happening there, right? So um, it's not just the talk, it has to be something much deeper than that. The arts help and embodied experiences also help, mm. but we need to do something because speaking just in, a, in, in spaces like this and having the, the politicians not, no offense, mm. <laughs> doing, <laughs> doing their show is not what we need right now. Mm. I think uh, we started a bit late, so we will continue for a few more minutes. I would very much like to bring in some questions from <coughs> the audience. I hope to get help with a mic from one of my colleagues. So I thought that we, if you have a question, raise your hand, and then we will take uh, a few questions, like gather three or four questions. So take notes, and then we'll go around, and you will uh, choose to answer what you feel connect, connects with you. Down here first. <coughs> okay, <laughs> change change of hearts. <laughs> Who was first first here? Let's take someone at the first row. No, I was just curious, Vanessa. You talked about there was a conflict in the. You said high speed resistance and low you no know, intensity. You talked about high and low intensity. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Because I didn't really understand it. Um, yeah, I have another question, a bit related to what Kevin said, but also in general. Um, I think when it comes to carbon budgets, we talk a lot about it as an, it's an end of pipe problem in the end. We don't look at the extraction of fossil fuels, but we look at the CO2 emissions that we have in the end on the consumer side, <coughs> which is like the whole discourse uh, in the climate change debate is about this consumer side approach to solving the problem. Um, and there is the question, how, how can we legitimate more the causes from Keep It in the Ground initiatives um, that struggle all over the world to really actually stop the fossil fuel companies to extract what later on turns into CO2 emissions. And then also maybe asking you uh, on, the, on the podium, like who of you actually suggests or would suggest to expropriate fossil fuel companies because that is what it would mean in the end if we are serious about cutting down the CO2 emissions because then they couldn't use the land, the fossil fuels, the gas they have in their stores anymore. So uh, I was wondering, uh, well, you were talking about well, what would it take for people to embody uh, this feeling and stop numbing themselves. And, and one thing is seeing the pain uh, of the world and of the people who are affected. But I was wondering, is it possible that one thing could be also to see the gain? Uh, of, because we are not living an emotionally, uh, existentially sustainable lifestyle either. People are not fucking happy. <laughs> it reminds me of apartheid in uh, South Africa, the white people would be rich and they would be numb. And it's kind of a similar situation, I think. So I wonder, could it be something positive, something that, that you could bring out what we can gain from changing? Of course, it's a painful transformation, but not just that we need to do something. Well, I think you get the point. <laughs> We have uh, actually several hands who've been up, um, but I think we should f start with those questions. You want this back, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who would like to start? Oh, okay, I can start. Yeah. I think the questions are related to. So the, when I talked in the morning about high intensity struggle and low intensity struggle, we, I was connecting a uh, high intensity struggle with the south of the north and the south of the south, right? And then the north of the north and the north of the south, 
or high, uh, low intensity struggles. So if we think about the Krenak indigenous person who was at the COP, he is in high intensity struggle because for a long time, for a long period and several generations, they have been fighting. Now, the low intensity struggles are the things that you're talking about. We already know it, this is not working, but we still enjoy the securities and the pleasures and the comforts, right? And the sensibilities are very different. So f I, in many ways, I'm always put in a position because probably my family is mixed. I have mixed indig indigenous heritage, mixed German heritage. And my dad actually married my mom to help uh, her lose her indigeneity. It, and it is part of the, of the struggle that we're talking about, the colonial struggle, right? And he did that to help and to stand up to his brothers who are actually killing indigenous people in Brazil. So it's like this progressive and not <laughs> movement. Um, so I'm a product of that. And generally I'm translating between the two. So finding a way to uh, have that connection in a different way right now we're breaking, Conversa uh, relationships are breaking when there's too much conflict. Finding a way to develop the stamina especially in those, for those who are living the low intensity struggle, to really be able to be present even to the pain and to find different sources of joy, right? Because it's not going to be the joy that you imagine it's going to be. And there's joy beyond the pain, but it's unimaginable right now what it looks like. What I've been hearing from uh, the communities in Mexico and in Peru is more or less this message. When you have uh, interrupted the satisfaction with the comforts and the, and the enjoyments you have here, they're waiting there to show what has happened and other ways of being joyful. But it needs, to, people who come need to come in a position of humility, because generally people come in a position of the tourist, right? And of uh, wanting to consume and to buy the experience. So it's still happening in that way. But once this breaks and once the water reaches the bump, there are people who have been swimming. And that and then they can't teach you how you can swim, but they can show you that it is possible. And then you will be able to to find your own way. But it's it's interesting because like when we're talking about the arts and the, the role of the arts in this, I work with an institute called uh, the Advanced Study for in, uh, the Advanced Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies. Uh, the Peter, Peter Wall Institute at the University of British Columbia. And they put humanities and uh, STEM together always to talk. And the position of humanities and arts are always like, as we're kind of entertainment or making it our beautification. <laughs> um, it's culture, it's discussion, but it's, it doesn't really, we, we don't have a conversation where it, it is edge to edge. So, one of the experiences that I had with uh, a colleague uh, who's a scientist, also climate scientist, an oceanographer, he's now the, uh, the director. He said, Vanessa, I can hear what you're saying, but I can't feel it, right? And I'm interested, but I can't feel it in my body. And I said, okay, come to the forest with me. We're gonna walk for two kilometers, but you're, you're gonna have your eyes um, folded. folded. And you have to trust me, uh, not only to trust me that I will walk you through the forest and through the bush, but you, you have to trust me that um, in the sense that I'll be asking you questions and that uh, I'm not uh, insane with the questions that I, I ask you. So we went and we did this walk with him blindfolded. In the beginning, he was super insecure and I kept asking him, with your eyes closed, what do you see? With your eyes closed, what do you see? Uh, and then, then we moved to who are you? with your eyes closed. And he reports it today as one of the most um, shifting experiences for him. But one of the things we talk about is that when you want to run a marathon, you're not just going to the gym once and then that's it, I've, I'm changed. You have to do it every day, right, to run that marathon. And then you run the marathon and the next year you start again. You go to the gym every day for that marathon. So the, the discussion now with him specifically has been, how do you keep it up in your life to uh, have these experiences beyond the realm of what you know, so that your body learns to unnumb, so that your body learns how to read again, right? But it's not, it cannot just be one, a one-off thing. That thing was good, great. Now you have to go to the forest every day with your, <laughs> with your eyes closed or find other ways.
right? And that's what I think the, the discussion between STEM and humanities um, has become stifled in this, okay, then tell me what I don't know. And it's not a telling you, it's a practice that you have to, ha to have in a constant way in your life. And unless you, you make that space for that different way of being to emerge, it's not gonna happen. And I will continue to be unintelligible, <laughs> which is, I think, okay to a certain extent. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. But I think there's a lot that is being missed in us not working together. Because if we had the scientists feeling it viscerally, engaging with the arts, doing the embodied work, imagine what we could achieve and what would be possible to even imagine from that space. Right now, we are in silos. And I agree with you in, in the sense that um, unless we start talking, right, and seeing the discomfort that you're talking about and, and getting to the edge, the edge is uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, and, and jumping a little bit into the unknown of each other, we won't be able to work together. Thank you. Jens? Uh, two quick answers. Uh, first, the issue on uh, expropriate the fossil fuel companies. Uh, well, what we would like to do is to uh, stop their business model, and that is uh, by banning extraction and use of uh, fossil fuels. And the sooner the better we could do that. Uh, your question about the uh, gains from uh, transformation, I think you are completely right. It's uh, such a uh, such a good uh, good point you're, you're raising. Uh, in my end uh, chapter of, of my book, uh, it's it's headed uh, it starts here and now. And uh, I, I think so many people, they, they, they dream of uh, working less uh, and having more time with family and friends and so on. So uh, a shorter working week uh, would be a very good uh, welfare thing to do, but also actually good for, for environment and climate, because then we would use more of, uh, we, instead of getting more money and shopping more, we would have more time, basically. Also... Just the way we, we live, uh, go out shopping, sitting in the car, going to an external shopping mall instead of, uh, of culture, instead of uh, doing sports, instead of being out in the forest and all these things you mentioned to Vanessa. To, uh, and I think if we can link in to those kind of visions, uh, shift to a sustainable and a more... Uh, just or fair uh, society that could be a vision for all of us. Thank you. Anja, would you like to share um, reflections? On I just uh, think that I think human nowadays uh, miss the link to nature and that's why we act as we act. We don't see how the forest change or how the animals act differently when we build new roads or new houses. So that's why I think it's very important to listen to indigenous people and how they think the nature should be used and preserved. Thank you. Kevin? Um, when it comes to climate change, I think it's quite distinct from sustainability. So I think a lot of what I'm, I'm hearing here is actually, I would say, applies to issues of sustainability. But I think climate change is different and actually much easier than sustainability. Sustainability is a much more complex, amorphous thing. And ultimately, it's going to be much more important if we, if we solve the climate change issue. And the climate change issue is a, is, a, is a small thing. It's about carbon molecules, principally from burning fossil fuels, but also from agriculture to some extent. Um, and there are alternatives. We can make that shift. And in fact, if we started in 1990, we could have carried on with the current business model and resolved these issues. We wouldn't have solved climate change. We'd have solved climate, sorry, we wouldn't have solved sustainability issues. We'd have just solved climate change. As we've left it later and later, I think actually we have to solve climate change as soon as possible. Um, and it's a matter of absolute urgency. And I think we, are, we are, have already failed quite a lot of that and it will inevitably get much worse. So I think we have to be, I mean, when I say people, we, you know, people need to engage more with nature, yes, for sustainability, but I don't think we have the time frame to do that for climate change. So I, I'm a, I think Flo's point is, is well taken, that we have to close down the fossil fuel industries. It is not good enough just to make renewables. We've got more renewables every year. We get more efficient every year, and we burn more fossil fuels every year. We burn more peat, oil, coal, and oil, and coal and gas every single year. We have to close down the incumbents. About 80% of known fossil fuel reserves have to be shut down. And if we're not going to do that, 
then we are actually, you know, that's the best indicator that we will either succeed or fail. And the best indicator of that is if Norway doesn't shut its fossil fuel industry down very soon, in other words, it has to, they have to be stranded assets, and if Scotland doesn't do it, then you know, we will go to hell in a handcart. They are the two you need to watch. And they'll just watch but encourage them to do it. Because if they don't do it, no other country in the world will. So you know, in a sense, if we want a market that's there, they're the ones. We have to shut them down. Renewables and efficiency will not solve the problem because they'll just be used in addition to the fossil fuels. Um, I take the point on seeing the pain. Um, and actually, I was going to mention it earlier, but I do, uh, I'll just throw it out there for some perhaps to discuss. I've had two experiences, short experiences, with virtual reality. I don't have a television. I'm not a great fan of all these sorts of new ways of communicating in some respects. But the VR experiences I had were, were visceral. They were down here. They were empathetic. They were hairs in the back of my neck, even when I'm thinking about it now. And I, I do not want people flying around the world to see the summers or indigenous people. I do not want people jumping on the pinnacle of fossil fuel combustion, the plane, and wandering around the world to see the disasters we're causing and causing more by doing it. But if we can get people to engage in other ways, and there's some really interesting work being done on VR to try and do that, I think it's very different to other forms of communication. If we can do that, then I think that's really positive, because I think it does get us something. If we can get someone there in the room with us where it starts to feel like you know, it's, we, you know, we, we, we empathize with the change, not just understand it. But I also am concerned this idea that um, we just sell the game. Uh, most emissions come from a small elite. That elite think they're doing remarkably well out of the current system, and they are. And they're often very happy with the current system. So we have to remind ourselves, you know, a lot of the friends I have, I used to work in the oil industry, who work in the oil industry, love their lives. They don't want us, you know, I can't go along to them and say, I want you to sell your second home. I mean, it's hard for most Swedes. Um, not drive to, drive to that quite regularly, not to fly to Ta Thailand or Bali to buy a smaller house, to not heat it as much. This is going to be a hard sell for that particular group. Um, I'd almost rather just use regulations and, and effectively to almost try and force that. We can, we can sell it to some people, but I don't think the majority of the high emitters will actually be, will, 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 they will see through the idea that we're offering them a better future. That's not to say we shouldn't try it, because we need to use all the tools available. And ultimately, um, what I would like, though I'm a, a strong leaning sort of socialist, I also have a very strong libertarian component. I want people to do what they want. I don't really care how they live their lives. I want maximum freedoms for people, as long as it does not infringe other people's free freedoms. And that is the most important point. You know, the freedom from always should trump the freedom to. But if it doesn't, if, if the freedom from is not affected, I'm, I want other people to do whatever they want. They can inject crack, if all I care, as long as it does not affect other people. So I, I, I don't want people to inject in crack. I want to live in a more, much more positive world. But I don't want to infringe other people's freedoms. I want an eclectic view of the world where other people have very different interpretations of it to the one that I have. But I do not want them to be affecting you know, indigenous people in Canada or the Samis or elsewhere. So the freedoms from and the freedoms to argument, I think we need to unpick that and actually Somewhere in the nub of that is the real solution. Are the real solutions to climate change? So we are quite a bit over time. We, I decide now that we won't have time for more questions from the audience. I'm very happy that there are still questions, and I hope that you can you can bring them um, to to the evening to to the rest. Uh, but before. You pack off. I would ask you to bear with me for one last question, just to sum up and finalize the panel. And uh, it's quite a challenging one, I realize, uh, 5.30 <laughs> in Monday evening. Uh, but I would very much like to hear your reflections on this one. Because what I hear is that uh, working with climate change is in a new way is something that will need practice from us. It's something that, th it's a process and it's something we need to engage with. And from what I see, it also entails seeing and understanding other people's perspe perspectives and being curious to always learn more from, from other people. And that's something that I hope that we will have the chance to do uh, in the conference in the two days to come after this one. So the closing questions, c question is, uh, which perspectives, or what perspective, uh, do you think you are missing and would like to explore in your work with climate change? So what perspective do you think that you yourself are missing and would like to explore in your work with climate change? I can start. I totally miss the economic aspect of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a good one. And uh, Vanessa mentioned that we are too much in silos, and I think uh, that's uh, completely true. Uh, there are I meet a lot with uh, environmentally against people and other uh, environmentally against politicians, but I want the uh, culture politicians. I want the uh, building house politicians, the finance politicians uh, also discuss uh, climate uh, change related issues. Uh, this is. This is an issue that should sort into all policy areas, and that is what, what I lack at the moment. Thank you. Vanessa? So, uh, how to shut down the oil companies? <laughs> 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 I've been involved in the protests. Um, I'm supporting the people who have been arrested in the protests at Bur Burnaby Mountain in Vancouver. And um, I see the criminalization of dissent. I see the criminalization of peaceful protest in Canada, and I think you're, yeah, why don't we just shut it down? It's just much more simple than protest, just the, 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 the coming through of it. I think pr protesting the, or interrupting when it's, or it's in business is one thing, but shutting down is another idea. Thank you. Mm. Thank um, you. To me, it would be the arts, actually. Um, scientists are not particularly good at communicating climate change and it also is not just about communicating it because that's very much an elitist sort of view the scientists pass the information on to the artists so it's an interplay mm -hmm. um, but I do think we need to get to climate change I mean you say what Klein was saying about this idea is we need to go on about it all the time that's true but also I think a lot of the time we don't want to use the term climate change we want to embed it in all sorts of other ways that we think about the world so I don't, I'm not just interested in high art and what we call high art in the UK a bit of the obscure bit of theatre or abstract artwork in a car park. Um, how do we get it into songs, into soaps, not as climate change necessarily, but just about living a different life? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's with the, with the arts really, um, I'd like to engage more with. Thank you, and thank to all four of you. Let's give them a big round of applause.